Hey YouTube, this is Francis Pepper, and today we're going to talk all about the health impacts of a potential nuclear war. And it won't be it, we're going to be through the event of the and if we can, it is going to be what it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to do the whole thing with this on, that'd be stupid. So in case you couldn't hear me before, welcome to Praxis Prepper, and today we're going to talk all about the health-related concerns uh, connected with nuclear war. Uh, I oftentimes do these videos sedentary, uh, but I was thinking today we should maybe walk around, because it's such a beautiful day. You just get some snow, it's gorgeous out, um, and just it's important to have fun, you know. Even in SHTF, you know, even if you're eating the burned out remains, the ashes out of your best friend's corpse just to stay alive. Yeah, let's go have fun with it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So health, related to nuclear war. Um, in a way, this is kind of the, the most important of all the videos. Um, not that the others aren't important, but health is what it's really all about. So let's start talking about that. Um, I took some notes today, because there's a lot here, and I, I don't want to miss any parts uh, of it. Um, and uh, you know, I apologize if I'm glancing at them occasionally, but... Uh, I wore sunglasses, so you won't necessarily know whether I'm looking at this or you. It's kind of rude, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, to begin with, um, when there is a detonation, if you see it in the sky, they always say, don't look at the blast, and that's good advice. You don't want to look at the blast. And the reason for that is uh, you don't want to damage your eyes uh, because the blast is sending out light and all sorts of energy, and you don't want that to be destroying your vision. Oh, geez, this is a slippery hill with the snow here. Um, if you happen to glance at it briefly, um, you can go blind temporarily. That's called, this is called flash blindness. If you sort of quickly see the flash and then you turn your head away. That can last a few seconds to a few minutes. Granted, I'm sure those couple of minutes are pretty freaking scary um, because, you know, nobody wants to go blind. Um, but don't necessarily freak out right away. If you just looked at it briefly, and your vision is gone, it doesn't necessarily mean you've lost your vision forever. In fact, you probably haven't. Now, if you see the fireball and you are looking right at it, and you're staring right at the fireball, and you're focusing that on the back of your eye, on your retina, um, you can give yourself retinal burns, and that can cause you to go blind indefinitely. Um, but again, like I said, if you just quickly see it, turn your head, you're probably gonna be okay, even if you go blind for couple seconds, couple minutes, or something like that, you're probably okay with that. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about after the blast is, you know, it's the radiation. That's what everybody's always thinking about. Um, that comes in a couple different forms. We're going to talk a couple uh, about some of the lesser damaging forms, and then we'll get to the, you know, the monsters later. Um, the less damaging forms are the alpha and the beta radiation. Um, those are just names. Uh, what do they mean? Alpha radiation uh, refers to what's essentially helium nuclei. Uh, that are being thrown out um, from, you know, fallout particles or whatever. Um, these are not that dangerous. Uh, you don't want to eat fallout because the alpha radiation can harm you. Um, you. You don't want to be inhaling particles because they're, like, in direct contact with your lungs. Um, but the, fall, the alpha particles really only travel just a couple inches, even through air, before they get effectively blocked. Not that big of a concern. Uh, but again, you don't want to be eating things because you can get uh, harmed by that alpha radiation. Beta radiation, um, a little bit more dangerous than the alpha radiation. Uh, beta radiation is essentially high energy electrons uh, being thrown off of, um, uh, of uh, fallout particles. Um, uh, these things, whoops, a little slippery out. Uh, these things are a little bit more dangerous, like I said, than the alpha particles. Um, uh, they can travel farther um, and they can also cause a little bit more damage. Um, but again, it's really only a problem if you get fallout like dust on your physical arm, on your skin, or you, if you consume something, because again, um, those fallout particles are in direct contact with your body in, for a prolonged period of time, and they're hitting you with all that, uh, uh, that radiation. So as long as you, you can clean dust off of yourself, and as long as you can, um, uh, you know, avoid eating or drinking uh, actual fallout, uh, you're going to be safe from those. Um, the last type uh, that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, 
um, is gamma radiation. And that's that's the monster stuff you want to avoid. But before we get to that, uh, we're going to talk about just a couple other sort of minor minor health concerns you want to be aware of. Um, and uh, uh, these are um, uh, related uh, to, uh, to heat. Uh, when there's an explosion, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of heat created in that explosion. And um, uh, that can send uh, super high uh, uh, temperature gases and particles uh, flying in all directions. And this is what's referred to as the popcorning effect. Um, and it's sort of like dirt and rocks and things like that are being superheated and exploding like little grenades, sending their shrapnel, their superheated shrapnel everywhere. If that hits your skin, you're going to get burns from that. So um, uh, the way you kind of prevent that is you know, covering yourself up. Uh, as best you can if you feel like you're going to be in an environment where you might be getting hit with a lot of a lot of heat. Um, and the treatment for that is, you know, the same way that you would treat burns. Um, uh, the other thing to be concerned about is, uh, and we mentioned this in relation to the, uh, the alpha and the beta particles, is uh, inhaling things. Uh, you don't want to be inhaling these particles because while they're not dangerous just if you're you know, walking around them, uh, if they're in physical contact with your lungs, that's a problem. If you can wear an N95 respirator mask, uh, that's going to pretty much solve your problem for you. You know, you know those things aren't perfect, but they're going to cut out a ton of, of um, what you would otherwise be inhaling. Um, for your shelter, if you can just install, you know, even a regular furnace air filter or an air conditioner air filter, um, while you know it's not you know a class 10 clean room, you are going to be eliminating an enormous fraction of everything that would otherwise be getting in. So that's all good stuff to do. Um, let's talk about the, you know, the monster, the gamma radiation, what that can do to you. Uh, that, that brings us to, you know, what's called, uh, radiation sickness. Uh, that's, that's the thing you see in movies where people are puking up blood and there's, their hair is falling out. It's, you know, it's the stuff you think about when you think about the illness from nuclear war. Um, to, uh, uh whoop, slipping again, uh, to address that, uh, we're going to have to get back to talking about exposure levels and, uh, those are measured in many different things. One of them is a word I keep butchering, rentgens. Rentgen or rentgen. Somebody corrected me in the comments uh, the other day, very politely, and I'm sure they knew what they were talking about, uh, given their occupation. I think they like ran a nuclear submarine or something like that. Um, I can't remember exactly what they said was the correct way to pronounce it, and I couldn't find their comment later. Um, but there's another way to refer to it, uh, which is REMS. Uh, REMS is a measurement of the impact of... Um, radiation on the human body, and REM star stands for, and I'll have to say it one more time, Röntgen. Röntgen, or Röntgen. And then equivalent E in, in man, so R-E-M. Röntgen, equivalent in man. Um, I assume this holds up for you ladies, too. You know, it's a chauvinistic world, sorry about that. That's what they, uh, that's what they call it. I'm sure someone has a new age version of REMS. I don't know what that would be, you know, like the, uh, uh, gender balanced version. So, but we'll just say REMS for now. Um, so let's talk about REMS. Uh, and these are things that you're going to measure on a fallout meter. Um, you know, if you have one, I'm going to recommend later that you you get, procure or make a fallout meter. Uh, I have some information on how you can make a fallout meter. But um, let's talk about the, the measurements that you you could be getting and what the results of those are. Uh, if someone gets exposed to 100 REMS in an acute um, exposure, which means like within 24 hours, where it's like it's the height of the attack, you're getting all this exposure all at once, because all this stuff is cumulative, um, but it also depends on, you know, how, how densely packed these, these moments of exposure are. So let's say in the first 24 hours you get 100 REMS of exposure. Um, most people, what does it say here, this, this is really what the notes are for, is this stuff. Um, most people are unlikely to even get sick if they get 100 REMS of exposure. And 100 REMS is, you know, it's, that's not the kind of thing you want to be messing around with in normal times. So you can get hit with quite a bit and you're still not really going to get sick. Um, let's double that. Let's go to 200 REMS. Um, even at 200 REMS, um, I can't, can't read while I'm walking. <laughs> it's bouncing around. Um, everyone should be able to recover from 200 REMS. You, you may feel a little ill, and we'll talk about the symptoms in a moment. But um, even at 200, man, I've been working on this trail, and this is the part of the trail right here where I've got like sticks and things. It's not really uh, smoothed out yet, so I'm like <laughs> putting my feet in holes and stuff like that. Um, e e even um, 
even at 200 grams, uh, pretty much everyone should be able to recover from that, even if they feel a little ill. Let's jump up to 350 rems. That's more than three times, you know, that, that lowest exposure we talked about. Um, and again, this is uh, all within that acute 24-hour periods, getting hit with it all at once, pretty much. Um, the majority of people, even 350 rems, you're going to... You're gonna feel you're gonna feel sick, but uh, the majority of people are gonna recover from that. Even if you don't get any medical intervention, you're gonna be all right. Okay, um, let's jump up to 600 rems. This is when things get dark. This isn't this isn't like the normal comedic show. It's I'm trying to like weave some humor into this, but it's like oh you're gonna die, you're gonna get this, you're gonna get that. Well, actually we haven't talked about the death. We're just about to though. Um, 600 rems. Um, you're gonna die within a few weeks. Sorry, dude, don't shoot the messenger. It sucks. You know, whatever. Um, and, you know, it gets worse than that, though. <laughs> uh, we're going to jump up to uh, 1,000 to 5,000 REMs. Um, uh, you're still going to die, uh, but you're going to do it through a tunnel of ordeal, including bloody diarrhea, fever, circulation issues. And those are going to appear within 30 minutes of getting exposed. So you're not going to you're not going to be sitting around wondering, oh, geez, did I get it? No, you're going to find out within a half an hour whether or not you uh, you got hit with that with that level. Um, after that initial sort of radiation sickness that happens right away, uh, you're gonna you're gonna start in with uh, the hair loss and the hemorrhaging, which is the bleeding. Um, that, that'll happen within a day, and you're going to be dead within two days to two weeks. So you know, sucks. But, you know, that's why we're doing these videos. Try to make the least number of people as possible have to go through that ordeal. At least if, they, if you have some foresight ahead of time. Um, there is one more level above that, and that's if you get more than 5,000 uh, REMs. Um, and uh, at that level, you pretty much get all the above, uh, plus a very painful death within 48 hours. Um, so it's almost better than getting a lower exposure because it's like it's over faster. But um, from what I've read, it's very painful. So, you know, try to avoid that if you can. Again, this is a very comical, upbeat <laughs> installment of my, uh, my program. So. But I hope it's informative, at the very least. All right, um, let's talk a bit, little bit about the, the symptoms of radiation sickness. Backtracking, you know, the, the kind of radiation sickness that isn't going to get you dead within a matter of, of days. Um, so the basic symptoms of radiation sickness are vomiting, nausea, dizziness, and a general feeling of illness. Which, if you think about it, is pretty much the exact same sort of symptom matrix that you would experience if you were, I don't know, like, fucking stressed out because you're sitting in a bunker and there's a nuclear war going on over your head. So, my sense is that, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to think that they got exposed to radiation when, in fact, you're just freaking freaked out because there's a nuclear war going on over your head and you're in this, like, little shelter and and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think there's a very high likelihood of psychosomatic symptoms here, and that is, is again, why it's very helpful to have that fallout meter so you can even know, you know, what the situation is outside, and you could possibly clear um, that possibility and say, you know, there's not radiation outside. You're just freaking out, dude. Calm down, you know, and take a chill pill. Are you, stock are you stockpiling chill pills? Let's see what else we got here. Um, Okay, if it is radiation sickness, uh, these uh, symptoms are going to appear after several hours um, if the exposure is in that low range, that 100 to 200 rems range. Um, again, if you get these symptoms within 30 minutes, um, and again, these are the same symptoms that you're likely to get just because you're freaking out, uh, but if you get them from radiation uh, within 30 minutes, that's like, you know, you're fucked. So... Again, more reason to freak out and more reason to get a follow-up meter so you can tell whether or not you were exposed or not and you don't just have to figure out whether or not you feel dizzy or not because you'll totally just make yourself think that you're dizzy. Um, now, these symptoms, uh, you know, provided that you're not going to die, uh, are going to end within a day or two. Uh, and after that, you're going to feel better, but th th this is what's called the latent phase when uh, your body's still very vulnerable to uh, radiation exposures. You really need to be very cautious with that. Take care of yourself, pamper yourself, get yourself back on your feet during that period. This is when your body's healing from that pummeling that it took during that acute phase. Um, now, if you did receive a severe do dose, that's when we're talking about the hair loss, the diarrhea, the bleeding out of the skin or the mouth or pooping blood out your ass and all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the fun parts of nuclear war. Um, 
Now, uh, if these symptoms do manifest, um, it's it's not again. It's not necessarily a death sentence. If you were in that like 600 below 600 REMS range, it's going to suck for you, but you can recover from that. And there are things that we can do that can uh, can help you to get better. Um, uh, one is antibiotics. Uh, your your body's going to be very taxed. Um, you know healing itself from all this radiation exposure, it's going to be very vulnerable to infection. So if you had the foresight to stockpile any antibiotics, uh, now would be a time to correctly start administering those. And I don't mean like to start chugging bottles and administer them correctly to try to um, you know, bolster your body's ability to fight off uh, any uh, potential infections. Now, um, you're not going to run down to the pharmacy after you've gone to your doctor to get a prescription for antibiotics. This is some stuff you have to get in, in advance. There are um, plenty of YouTube videos you can check out on how to get antibiotics, um, you know, without a prescription. Uh, the basic way that everybody does is um, fish antibiotics, you know, for your fish tank. You can get them from fish tank stores or, or you know, they call them pet stores, don't they? You should call them pet stores. Um, or you know you can order them online. Um, I'm not going to put a bunch of links here because you know you can find that on your own. I um, have also done a lot of research about which antibiotics have the longest shelf lives. Um, in connection with there were some military studies about you know uh, what's uh, what stuff is good way past expiration. Some of the ones that I have found that are very good, well past expiration um, if if stored properly, um, are amoxicillin, penicillin. Ciprofloxacin and doxycycline. There are others, but those four, just those four alone, are uh, very effective even well past expiration date. Uh, and they are, every one of those is available in a fish form, um, which, um, from what I understand, is just as potent and just as effective as something you might get uh, from your doctor. So, uh, Again, if you were exposed to radiation, your immune system's gonna be down, you're gonna wanna um, have an ability to, uh, to fight off infection without having to leave your storm shelter, your fallout shelter and run to the, the pharmacy because you won't be able to anyway, dude. Um, now, uh, also to, to help people uh, to get better, just basic things, good diet, low stress, rest, hygienic surroundings, uh, all that stuff's gonna help somebody to recover. The, the stuff you do, you know, just in general if you're sick, that's all, that's, that's all gonna be very helpful. Um, it's also very important at the moment, I, I think, to stress that um, people who have been exposed to radiation, they are not a danger to others. Uh, it, it, they're not like a glowing source of radiation themselves. Uh, so if you wanna nurse and care for someone, you, you can do that with no concern for your own safety. Um, you don't have to, ha you know, have a, a lead vest on or anything like that. Now, this person uh, may well have consumed or inhaled these particles, uh, and uh, those particles, you know, will be coming out of their body, you know, uh, possibly, uh, you know, in the form of, you know, vomit or, uh, you know, their excrement or, or whatnot. Um, so, and this is very important, I know this is going to be difficult for some people, you're going to want to avoid consuming their vomit and or excrement. I know, in tough times, you know, sometimes those can be the most delicious dishes, but, you know, you're going to have to just go cold turkey copperfages. I'm sorry. Okay, so no, no poop eating uh, of anyone that's been exposed. Um, you also probably don't want to cannibalize their body um, if they were acutely, uh, uh, super acutely uh, exposed to it. So I know that's, that's unwelcome news to many of my viewers, but um, I'm sorry. Again, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Um... Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the most vulnerable. Who's the most vulnerable? Because, um, uh, you know, usually you think about, like, you know, cold and flu season. It's, you know, the kids or the elderly, you know, that uh, you've got to, uh, you, know, you know, take the most precautions around. And kids still, especially unborn kids, you know, uh, you know in, uh, fetuses, uh, you know, inside their mom, are super susceptible to radiation exposure. You really want to protect those people the most. Uh, protect everyone, but if you if you have to triage your protection, those people are going to be the most vulnerable. The elderly, uh, strangely enough, um, are are not more uh, susceptible than a regular healthy adult to radiation sickness. In fact, they are sort of bulletproof in a certain way because uh, one of the downsides of radiation exposure is um, cancers later in life that you know come on after you know a decade or so, and um, a lot of old people are going to die of old age before the cancers would ever, uh, you know, take them out. So, um, 
in a way, it's like it's kind of like in a nuclear holocaust, Grandma becomes like this superhero because she can she can just take the shit and it's not going to catch up with her in time to kill her. Um, so if you need someone to do like fucking hazmat duty, send Grandma out. Seriously, you know what I'm saying? No, you got to make your own decisions on that. But you know what I'm saying? Uh, that one threat is not going to. Uh, is not going to take grandma down. There are others, and, and even elderly people have to avoid, you know, getting that acute exposure. It's not like they, you know, are, are completely bulletproof, but um, uh, having that, that built-up exposure over time that would give other people cancers, you know, 20 years from then, you know, grandma's going to be dead anyway. So, I'm sorry, that sounds really harsh and cold. It's a cold, cold world we live in, isn't it? Yeah. Let's see, what else we have here? Let's get back to saving lives instead of uh, throwing them away. Um, KI pills. <coughs> also known as potassium iodine. Uh, this is something you might be familiar with. It's, they're oftentimes issued to people uh, who live near nuclear power plants in case of a meltdown. Um, I had addressed some questions on these in comments earlier. Um, and uh, what I said, while technically true, uh, was probably misleading to people. I, I, I'd said that in my research at that point, uh, it had seemed as though potassium iodine pills were not something necessarily useful during a nuclear exchange. That was more specifically for a, a meltdown. Um, that was true. My research did uh, demonstrate that to me at that time. I've done more research since then and found out that that is not the case. Uh, uh, KI pills, potassium iodine pills, are useful during a nuclear exchange, so you will want to uh, you want to stockpile them and have those for you. Um, uh, the half life of iodine, radioactive iodine, that might be released during a nuclear exchange is eight days. Uh, so if you want to wait for those uh, radiation levels to diminish to diminish to one one thousandth of um, where they were during the initial exchange, which is sort of the, the recommended wisdom here, you're, that means you're going to need to wait eighty days between the attack and when you can feel like the radiation levels are, are down to that degree. Um, so that means 80 days worth of pills for you and anyone else that you know you feel responsible for. The standard uh, size pill is 130 milligrams. They're very easy to come by. You can buy them anywhere. They cost about 40 cents a pill or so. That's at least what I'm finding. Um, and uh, for very young uh, people, uh, you know, uh, little kids, like toddler, younger than toddlers, uh, it's usually recommended that a, a pill is cut in half. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, it'd be crushed down. Um, mentioning that, it's important to say that from what I've been researching, potassium iodine tastes like ass. Um, it, when you're when you're swallowing the pill, it's covered up in a um, uh, kind of a gelatin coating, um, and that protects you from the taste. But if you crush it, you know, you got that ass taste in your mouth. Um, actually, it doesn't really literally taste like ass. I hear it tastes like an incredibly disgusting metallic. Yeah, it's just gross. It's fucking gross, you know? So um, anything you can do um, to protect your little child from, you know, just spitting it back out uh, it would be helpful. Put it in milk, put it in orange juice, uh, crush it, wrap it into a piece of bread and have them swallow it. Anything like that that you can do is very, very helpful. Um, to just get it down. Uh, I said you should stockpile of pills, uh, you know, have an 80 day supply for yourself and anyone else that you want to care for. If you are not able to do that, if you don't do it, if you think it's stupid and then later on something happens and you wish you'd done it, uh, here are some things that you should not do as like MacGyver versions of, of potassium iodine. Don't go into your medicine cabinet, find a, a bottle of iodine and think that you can drink it or take drops of that. Iodine is poison. So, um, that's not going to work. Uh, it, it may partially protect your thyroid from cancer, which is the point of taking potassium iodine, but um, it's going to do a lot of other problems. So uh, do not do that. Also, uh, you're probably familiar with iodized sea salt uh, that you can buy at the store. Maybe you'd think, oh, well, I, I didn't get potassium iodine, but I could get um, you know, this iodized sea salt, and if I could just eat enough salt, maybe that'll be uh, enough to protect me. Uh, no, no, the, the iodine level in it is so small. Uh, that you would basically turn yourself into beef jerky before you uh, <laughs> you were able to protect your thyroid. So that's not going to work. Um, what you can do if you don't have um, uh, any potassium iodine is that you can uh, find ways of limiting your exposure uh, to the, the radioactive iodine, which is what you're trying to protect yourself from. 
um, don't eat food um, uh, like animal food. Uh, animals that were killed by the fallout because it's just gonna be it's gonna be all in their bodies uh, you can wash fall off off of food and that's true but as much as possible try to avoid eating that food for as long as you can if you have other food stores eat those first uh, because the ambient levels of radiation out here are going to be falling every single day every day is safer than the, the day before so so hold off on eating that type of stuff as long as you possibly can and if and when you feel you do need to eat something that you feel might have had fallout uh, particles or dust on it, wash it, wash it, wash it. Uh, just make sure it's very, very clean uh, to, to get all that fall off, uh, off, off of it. Um, the, the, the food itself is not the danger, it's the contamination of what might be mixed in with it. Uh, if a food gets irradiated, that doesn't make it radioactive. It's, it's the particles on it that make it radioactive that can hurt you. Um, uh, also, uh, breathing protection, uh, respirate, uh, you know, even an N95 mask is, while not perfect, is going to reduce a lot of the, uh, the particles that are going to be going into your, your lungs, possibly. So uh, that's a way of, of reducing your um, uh, radiation exposure. Um, let's talk just about uh, proper ventilation and getting enough air in general. Uh, you know, I, I said you could use you know, filtering to get air into your shelter, because uh, uh, you do need fresh air, uh, and it really is important to do that. I, I, you may be afraid of the fallout dust and all that, and it's a legitimate concern. You should be, um, but um, you also can't just be in a box and not get any fresh air. It's gonna make it's gonna make you feel like shit, and you know, eventually suffocate you. So, you need to have that that fresh air coming in. Don't uh, don't disregard that. Um, uh, you know, do whatever you can to, to filter that air, get some distance between you and the outside, but you need to have fresh air coming in. A um, couple last little things that, that aren't directly uh, nuclear related, uh, other than I said um, fallout meters. Uh, definitely um, the, the Crescent Kearney book I talk about a lot, uh, the nuclear war survivor skills. In the back of that book, there is a design for how you can make your own fallout meter. I know that sounds amazing, you make your own fallout meter. Um, but it's possible with just crap you have around your home, possibly. Um, and you don't have to have any tremendous technical expertise. So download that book. Get it. And uh, it's free. Um, pooping and peeing. Everybody poops. Uh, and what do you do with that? Um, I had been under the impression that I really needed to do a tremendous, um, uh, like a big project about like getting the... the excrement out of my shelter. I was going to have to do pumps and everything like that. But from what I'm reading, it doesn't have to be that crazy. What, uh, what's possible is really a simple way. If you're, if you're pooping, say, into a bucket, just poop into a bag in a bucket. And every couple days, just take that bag, tie it up, open the door quickly, and throw the thing outside, and then close the door and get back in. You're going to get a little bit of radiation exposure while you're out there, a few seconds, maybe a minute's worth. But... Um, it's really a cumulative issue. You're going to get very, a very small amount of radiation during that, that brief moment. So bag it, throw it outside. Uh, in your shelter, you can have things like sawdust or things like that that can help to diminish uh, the, the smell. But you don't want to be storing that stuff in your shelter because the, the stench alone is going to get everybody vomiting and feeling like crap. So don't do that. Get rid of it. Throw it out. That's a great job for Grandma. Hazmat duty. Here, Grandma, here's a bag of shit. Throw it outside for us. You know, the, the radiation will never catch up with you. Um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, something that's kind of a, a general thing, but I'm just going to mention it here because it's very useful. There's a wonderful book called Where There Is No Doctor. Uh, and this is a book that was written kind of for like missionaries going to, for the, uh, going to the third world. Uh, and it it's just a wonderful uh, asset to have. Let's say you're in your shelter and someone's got something. I don't know what that is. I'm not going to give a big list of it. It could be this or it could be that. It could be the other thing. Someone, there's something wrong with someone. Uh, this is a great resource where you can go through and try to help that person if you don't have any um, uh, medical expertise otherwise. Um, I would highly recommend getting it. It's not that expensive uh, to buy a copy of that, and it can give you a, a lot of peace of mind. So that's what I've got for today, um, for this installment. Uh, I, I hope you found it enjoyable. I, I'm sorry if it was a little long-winded, but like I said, there's a lot of information. I wanted to get it all uh, in there for you. Um, most of all, what I hope is that this series isn't making you more afraid or more freaked out. I hope that this series is making you feel better about all this, uh, knowing what the real concerns are. Um, and, and, and some things that you can really do uh, 
to make things better for yourself. So I, I hope you find peace of mind in this instead of it being, you know, a scaremonger, scaremonger kind of thing where I'm, uh, you know, trying to freak everybody out. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'll have more information coming up in some other installments. Uh, I'm going to be kind of spacing them out as we go forward. I feel like I've gotten the, the most important bits of the uh, of the information out to you already, but there will be some more installments in this series. Um, but that's it for today. So thank you very much for watching.